Chapter 11 Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Paul says, forgive me on my boasting, in which he knows he's about to go into. Because these false apostles, they probably said, well, we knew Jesus, we walked with him, we saw him and all of these things. And Paul, he's just an imposter, he's just trying to, all of this. So Paul says, okay, here are my credentials. Verse 3. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Now this is much more an insult to them than anything. Notice how Paul mentions another Jesus. And we see other religions doing this to this very day, far more so than they ever did in Paul's day, mind you. More so than ever. This New Age Jesus that they speak about, the Jesus of the New Age, differs from the biblical Jesus. The New Age separates Jesus from Christ. They take away his divinity. Jesus was one of many Christ or teachers, they say, who came to show the way. They teach how you can become Christ which is called the Christ consciousness. They say, yes, there was a Jesus of Nazareth, and he just found out this new age thing that we're on to. He knew about these secret mysteries, and he became a Christ. Instead of being the way, he's only showing the way, as many other teachers do. Now, this is their claim. The idea that through meditations, visualizations, and I am affirmations, one becomes connected to their divine essence, a little Christ Followers are taught to visualize Jesus or some ascended master to seek his divine counsel. This is Eastern mysticism repackaged to undiscerning Christians, or supposed professing Christians, that is. We are saved by faith, not by becoming Christ through New Age techniques. And many people don't realize how in Islam, the Muslims, they say that they love Jesus. I cannot call myself a Muslim unless I believe in and honor Jesus as peace be upon him. His miraculous birth brought an enormous amount of goodness and light to this world. May we draw closer to all the prophets of Allah. I made an entire video about these different religions, New Age, Islam, all of these. Islam claims that Jesus or Issa was one of the most important prophets and born of a virgin, but was created like Adam and was not God's son, nor died on the cross. They say that Allah has no son. But coming right back to verse 4, Paul says, With such as these that teach these false doctrines, this other Jesus, Paul says, Ye might well bear with him. He's not telling them you should bear with him. He says you would bear with him, being how shaky that you all are. For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles, meaning I'm on the level with even the greatest apostles. But though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been truly made manifest among you in all things. And this was one of the charges that they brought against Paul. Well, he's not a good preacher. You know, the idea is, Albert Barnes, my language is that of a plain, unlettered person. This was doubtless charged upon him by his enemies, and it may be that he designed in part to admit the truth of the charge. Verse 7, Have I committed an offense in abasing myself, that ye might be exalted, because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely? I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. To which Paul's not literally meaning, of course, that he robbed other churches. He's meaning that other churches gave to him in order for the benefit of the Corinthians. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man. For that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia, where Corinth was located once again. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knows, but what I do that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, 
that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. Now, just to catch everyone up on this, Paul, he's saying, I took nothing from you, Corinthians. And believe it or not, this was probably one of the accusations against Paul, that wherein they glory, once again, Albert Barnes, probably meaning that they boasted that they preached the gospel for free or gratis, that they received nothing for their labors, these false apostles. Yet while they did this, it is not improbable that they received presents of the Corinthians and under various pretenses contrived to get from them an ample support, perhaps much more than would have been a reasonable compensation. People who profess to preach the gospel for free usually contrive in various ways to get more from the people than those who receive a regular and stipulated compensation like an ordinary pastor. Because such wolves may use that for one of their credits. And they say, well, look, I'm not taking any pay from any of you. And thereby, they start to put this image in the people's head, you know, about, oh, he's so good. Therefore, let's give him a whole lot more than anything else. So, or something along those lines. Very sneaky are these false prophets. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Paul is resting right here on that law in which God has always laid down about how you reap what you sow. I say again, let no man think me a fool. If otherwise, yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast myself a little. He says, okay, if they're going to do these things, then at least let me share with you what I have suffered for the sake of Christ. That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly in this confidence of boasting, seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. For ye suffer fools gladly, seeing ye yourselves are wise. Essentially meaning you tolerate or endure those who are really fools. This is perhaps, says Dr. Bloomfield, the most sarcastic sentence ever penned by the Apostle Paul, to which I'll repeat again, For ye yourselves suffer or allow fools gladly, seeing ye yourselves are so wise. Meaning, y'all are stupid for doing this. For ye suffer or allow. If a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face, I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak. Howbeit, wherein soever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. In prisons, more frequent. In deaths, oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes save one. So five times, Paul received 39 stripes, 40 save one. Why didn't they go all the way to 40? The law of Moses in Deuteronomy 25, 3 expressly limited the number of stripes that might be inflicted to 40. In no case might this number be exceeded. This was a humane provision and one that was not found among the pagan who inflicted any number of blows at discretion. Verse 25, thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep. That actually terrified me more than any of them. A night and a day he had been in the deep. We'll come to that right here in a second. But he says right here, three times I suffered shipwreck. Now, mind you, this was before his shipwreck at Malta, which was about to come. So we know that another time after these three, so there were four shipwrecks and shipwrecks alone were just absolutely petrifying. But once again, he says right here, a night and a day I've been in the deep to which pulpit noted an allusion to his escape from one of the shipwrecks by floating for 24 hours on a plank in the stormy sea. The perfect tense shows St. Paul's vivid reminiscence of this special horror. In the deep means floating on the deep waves. I actually got to looking up the risk of being in that situation. And if you're not on um, part of the ship or something into which Paul, who knows, may have not have been. I don't know. But more than likely, he was on something of this nature. But if his body were in any way in the water, 
Surviving 24 hours is difficult in itself. Some of the main risks include hypothermia, dehydration, exhaustion, predators, etc. The video that I watched in researching this, they said that if your body is in any way in the water, try not to move it around very much. Uh, predators seem to uh, be more attracted to movement. And they actually made note about it's so horrible to be in that spot that the best remedy is just to never be in that spot. <laughs> just never get yourself in that. So Paul truly faced horror after horror. But he's not done. Verse 26, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. And though the book of Acts doesn't probably mention even half of what he went through, we do know from that book, from tumults he mentions, of these dangers, frequent mention is made in the Acts, the book of Acts, as in Damascus, after that in Jerusalem, then in Antioch, in Pisidia, Iconium, Thessalonica, Berea, Corinth, Ephesus, all before the writing of this epistle. So many people want to be like Paul. But do you even know what that entails? I mean, he's like the one of the very first real missionaries, and he just faced so many terrible things. And I have heard about many great missionaries of our day in whom have went to these strange lands and have been martyred viciously. Beside those things that are without, meaning outside, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches, who is weak, and I am not weak, who is offended, and I burn not, if I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. And what he's meaning right here in verse 29 is, I sympathize with you. If you're weak, so am I. If you're offended, so have I been. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. In Damascus, now he goes all the way back to the very beginning. And this chapter actually ends with this. And it's kind of unusual, but then again, you kind of see how even from the very beginning, whenever he was converted on the road to Damascus, about how trouble came upon him almost immediately after those three years in Arabia. In Damascus, the governor under Aretas, the king, kept the city of the Damascenes with a garrison, desirous to apprehend me. The whole city apparently turned against him, and through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. And it really leaves off with this feel that he's about to go over the specifics of what he went through, but then he stops right there before he goes any further. And then in chapter 12, we're going to pick up where he reads, It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. This doesn't help anything, he says. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. And what a vision he speaks about. Join me then, if you will, Lord willing. God, peace be with you. Amen.